You are listening to the cycling podcast at the Tour de France, brought to you by iWoka. Flexible loans built for small businesses. iWoka.co.uk. Today, we're in Lyon. Hello, my name is Richard Moore. I'm with the maestro of Marseille. François Thomaso. Oh, well, that, the nice nickname. Sell for that. Yeah, well, yeah, for now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the Watford Warbler. The Lionel Watford Brennan. Warbler. Or the, or the Wag. The Wag of Watford, maybe. The Wag of Watford. Wag of Watford. Okay, You're a bit right. of a wag, Lionel. Yeah, I mean, I'll take that. That's better than some of the nicknames I've earned yeah, on this you, tour. You've had, a, you've had a, a few good lines, this this tour. People people enjoyed your Tibo line about Tibo Pino last night. He should have... Yeah, uh, uh, Moyen Islam, our very good friend, uh, Thibaut Pino, super fan, um, crushed when Pino slipped out of the GC. Tough day for him hearing that um, yeah. description of Pino's tour, but it was more a, a, more a dig of Francois really well, than of course, Pino. that's okay then. <laughs> the maestro needs a, a dig every now and well, again. Well, I think, you know, if when Greg, when Greg Van Avermaet finishes 28th in the Tour de France, you say, oh, what a remarkable performance. And then when Pino is 24th, the thing Well, that's the thing about the currency <laughs> of the Tour de France. One, one man's 28th is different to another man's 28th, isn't it? That's the whole point. You know? That's... Uh, um, Bart, Sim- Bart Simpson said the secret <laughs> to happiness is low expectations. <laughs> and Pino came in to the tour with high expectations. He did. He did. Um, somebody else, uh, I must, uh, Nick Squillari, regular correspondent on social media with us. Um, <laughs> I have to, sorry, Nick, for this, from what I'm about, I'm about to do. But he tweeted us today, mid stage, say Sunweb tactics have gone from Napoleon to Mike Bassett, England manager. <laughs> that was a little bit premature, Nick, um, <laughs> because, well, Sunweb played a blinder, didn't they? They did. The end? They did. Where are we, Lionel? Well, we're in, well, we're on the outskirts of Lyon, really, aren't we? Mm-hmm. Uh, he, big, big city. Francois, you declared it the worst traffic in France. Well, in it, is, it is definitely terrible. Absolutely terrible. They say they claim it is because they have two rivers, the the Rhone and the Saône, and the third river being Beaujolais, as everybody knows. But, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's odd. It's always been a, a nightmare. They've got the, the tunnel, uh, you know, going through F- F- Fourvière, which is the, the, the hill above Lyon. And it's always been known as the, you know, the, 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 the worst you know, traffic jam in France. So now they've got two different rings going around the city, one in the west, one in the the, the east. And yet, you know, it's, it doesn't seem to be improving anything. It's it's absolutely terrible. But we're in our favorite hotel, aren't we? We've been here <laughs> yeah. before. <I'm, laughs> we are in a hotel I mentioned in, in one of our Grantle diaries uh, oh, a couple, right, yeah. couple of years ago, the, the Golden Tulip uh, Saint-Priest um, and it's 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 an it's in a new kind of technopole, as they, they say, and you know, tech can kind of a high tech area with businesses. And uh, well, we're not too far from. We the fit in here, don't we? Mm. <laughs> we're well, we're a high tech business, <laughs> Richard. <laughs> <laughs> we are. <laughs> well, we're not too far from the stadium. I mean, the, the Stade des Lumières, uh, you know, the Olympic Lyonnais Stadium. Uh, it's it's a kind of a well. Uh, f- I was about to say wasteland, but it probably was wasteland before they 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 started building these kind of warehouses and buildings with, with lots of glasses and uh, well, uh, well, yeah, you know, the Lyon you know kind. football stadium is is sponsored by Group Arma, mm-hmm. and we're sharing a hotel with a a team from Nice. Uh, well, one of the the Nice, um, probably under eighteen. I suppose yeah, they're under they're eighteen. They're all probably. walking around their Ineos gear. Yeah, so yeah. sponsored worlds, by Ineos. Worlds collide. Owned by Ineos, of course. <laughs> what happened in the stage, Lionel? Well, I was just going to pick a, up on that. Pick up on, on your on your. I'm on anxious your, to get. To can, that. Yeah, I can't we'll wait get there in a minute. We'll get there, there in a minute. The we'll get there in a minute, Richard. <laughs> um, tomorrow's stage actually starts at the Stade de Gelland, the mm-hmm. old oh, yeah. Olympic Lyonnais Stadium, which has got a really interesting. I think the rugby team still play there mm-hmm. um, it's got a really interesting roof design um, but yeah interesting that they would start there and not at the group armor stadium having started at uh, Jim Ratcliffe's place Nice's stadium at the uh, at the beginning of the tour not repaying the compliment to group armor there but well that's politics and that's I mm. guess the uh, Money talks when it comes to hosting the start of the tour stages. Well, let, let's not get back to the uh, you know the the, the green mayor uh, because we we treated that uh, we dealt with it uh, in the last episode. Well, the tale of the attack then, chaps. Stage fourteen from Clermont Ferrand to Lyon, classic transitional stage on the tour, and the race set off without Roman Bardet, who 
We heard late last night would not start today's stage because of concussion sustained in that crash. We really didn't discuss this at all, um, so we will make amends for that in tonight's episode. We've got. Well, we didn't know, did we? That we there, was con- there was concussion. We didn't know there was concussion, but of course, the footage of the the uh, the aftermath of the crash and him getting to his feet unsteadily and then uh, sitting back down again rather abruptly and then getting back on his bike. I mean, very difficult from that footage to draw any real conclusions, but nevertheless, that hasn't stopped people. We will um, get a word from somebody inside the AG2R team about that. But yeah, the tour goes on without Bardet. And I think the first time that he's abandoned the Tour de France, he's Mm -hmm. finished every tour he started. Wasn't a great day for AG2R because Pierre Latour has abandoned as well. He's been struggling really since the crash on the first day and probably done quite well to get through two weeks. But uh, the the worst of his injury is a hip injury. Yeah, on, oddly, him. just the, you know, the, 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 the two AG2R leaders are out of the tour and the two AG2R leaders won't be with AG2R next year. That's right. Well, the stage itself was uh, a, a cracker for Sunweb, as you say, Richard. Um, early on, Edward Tones of... Trek Segafredo attacked. He was uh, joined by Case Bowl of Sunweb and then Stefan Kung of Group Armour FDJ rode across and that looked like a reasonable trio but Sunweb's Casper Pedersen also tried to go across to the break and uh, Bowl decided that he would drop back to help his teammate get across and well that backfired on them and as you say the tactics look, did look a bit like Mike Bassett England manager from the from the film <laughs> which lampoons a terrible tactical um, non maestro uh, <laughs> and well the two Sunweb riders dropped back and uh, left uh, Kung and Tunes to it Sam Bennett in the green jersey was dropped on one of the early climbs uh, as were plenty of riders but with 50 points on the line for the stage winner it was a great opportunity for Peter Sagan to close the gap in the race for the green jersey Kung dropped turns on one of the climbs along the way and went on for a bit more but then he was eventually caught as well because Bora Hansgrohe were really driving it with a little bit of help from CCC remember Matteo Trentin won here in Lyon in 2013 when he was riding for Etix Quickstep um the finale was absolutely sensational to watch and uh, you know I rewound rewound online and watched it again because the last 11 or 12 kilometers were just it's difficult we we apply a kind of tactical genius to what Sunweb did after the fact but uh, you know they can't have planned it to have gone as well as it did but the first move was on the Côte de la Duchère climb which was a move by Tish Benoot uh, Laura, um, Laura Madouas, sorry, that's Valentin. his father. No, his father, father. Yeah. Valentin, Valentin Madouas <laughs> went what, after him. What an impressive race he's having. Second day in a row, we've seen him ride really well. Absolutely. He must, his legs must have been like uh, concrete after his ride yesterday, but he was looking lively again. Uh, Benoot was caught three and a half or so kilometres later. And then Leonard Kamner, another rider we saw in the thick of things yesterday, had a very big day out in the front yesterday, looking good on the climb. And uh, he was then sort of counter-attacked by Thomas Degen and then Julian Alaphilippe. And that really woke up the, the bunch behind. With four kilometres to go, Mark Hershey, stage winner a few days ago, attacked. Peter Sagan tried to react. And then when Hershey was caught, Soren Kraut anderson also of Sunweb. So that was the third Sunweb attack in quick succession. Kraut anderson went away and that was the one that stuck and he took the stage another first time Tour de France stage winner a really impressive victory um, for Sunweb and w- I mean they were they were the uh, kind of the uh, the team of the first week I said in terms of bang for buck I mean this week they've got two tour stage wins uh, the sprint was then won by Luca Mezjek of uh, Mitchell and Scott with Simone Consoni of Cofidis in third. Peter Sagan didn't really capitalise as much as he might have done. The points really fell away from first down to fourth and he only got 18 on the line but he has closed the gap to Sam Bennett to 43 points. Casper Pedersen got fifth and uh, Mark Hershey was also in the top 10 I think. Three so in the top 10. Yeah. Amazing, yeah. An yeah. amazing yeah. day It was the same Sunweb. when Hershey won. You had three Sunweb guys in the top 10. So That's right. T- great team efforts each time. One other little thing uh, because we're going to hear from him in the episode later. Richie Port had a little problem with eight, eight and a half kilometres to go. Took him two and a half kilometres to get back in but he ha- after a bike swap. The cycling podcast interview. Well, <laughs> I did think <laughs> that I spoke at the time. To him this morning at the start and he was, he was happy as Larry. <laughs> Reborn Richie. Yeah. And, uh, I couldn't believe 
believe it when I saw that, but but no damage done. He, well, he got back in within a couple of kilometres or so. Um, but this finish in Lyon is a good one. It goes over those urban climbs. It looks like a, a proper... Well, it is a finish in a proper city. We've had this finish, or a very similar finish in the Dauphiné. John Degenkolb won, I think, 2011. Well, it was 2011 because I was here. And then the Trentine finish was similar, if not identical. But that uh, little flurry of climbs really made it uh, an exciting finale. Well, and yeah, it makes you want to suggest to the Lyon mayor that in, on top of the Tour de France, they could have a classic finish in Lyon. <laughs> you are listening to the Cycling Podcast, brought to you by Iwoka. Flexible loans built for small businesses. Join 50,000 customers taking on life's twists and turns and scaling new height with iWoka. If you run a small business, find out more at iWoka.co.uk. I W O C A.co.uk. Thanks very much indeed to iWoka, our title sponsor. Um, we're very grateful to them for their support. Uh, they've been backing us since March, and this is our first Grand Tour with iWaka support. If you run a small business or know someone who does, uh, go to iwaka.co.uk and you'll find there lots of information as well as uh, information about um, loans that they offer to help you um, develop your business. Uh, Francois, have they been in touch with you yet? No, not yet, but I'm sure they're, they're waiting for the Only a matter of time. The Maybe they'll get you to set up the French office. Well, I would be delighted to do that. I, I'm sure it would be exciting and great. You know, I, I'm, I'm past my, my prime, you know, in terms oh, I don't of cycling and reporting. But I, and the new career is... Uh, I'll come and get me plea from <laughs> Francois Thomas there to our title sponsors, Iwaka. Thank you, Iwaka. Very much. We're very grateful to you. Um, well, another great display of team tactics from Sunweb. Matt Winston, the, the coach, said afterwards that... You know, they were all in for a Sunweb win. And watching today reminded me of Pyrenees. Um, Pyrenees, they were they didn't win the race overall. Matt Shackman won the race overall. But they were the team of the race. Um, we saw them on numerous occasions launching multiple attacks with Crow Anderson, Tesh Banut, and not Mark Hershey. But Craig Anderson who won a stage. In he won a stage, yeah. And, and, and they, 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 they do that really well. Um, and they did it well again today. It was interesting at the finish to see that one of the first people to stop and congratulate Crow Anderson was Tom Demula, a former teammate who seemed very happy on his behalf. But yeah, they, they've they've you know they have. It looks like they've had a clear plan now. Of course, every team has a plan. Executing that plan is is a different matter. Um, but they've got good good riders who, as Matt Winston said, bounce off each other really well. And we saw it today. They they had numbers up there. And it was just firing them up the road one after the other, and it paid off. It is, it's obviously a plus for them to, to have uh, you know, so many great riders, actually, gifted riders, young and old. I mean, Nico Roach must the be... The youngest f- team in the race, though. Yeah, but yeah. in the same time, Nico Roach and, you know, and some other, uh, uh, you know, uh, but must feel kind of rejuvenated to be to be in, the, in there uh, as well. And But the thing is that they don't have a leader. I mean, they, they could have been kind of burdened by, by Michael Matthews. Be, be, because he would have been perfect for today, wouldn't yeah, he? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But they would have all been working for him, you know. Uh, th- th- they're no great riders. I mean, very talented. Uh, uh, right? What well, Tishbenut is, uh, you know, is, is, is well, we, we we saw today that he's, he's had issues, you know, health issues in the start of the tour. He's, he's among the many, many riders who crashed in this Tour de France. But the, 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 here, you know, GC not not a problem at all. Uh, sprints, well, Casper Pedersen, but I mean, he's not the, the, he's not among the top top ten or top five favorites to, to win a sprint so the, it's really all for a stage win with, with very with a very you know cohesive uh, uh, you know outfit uh, all together and, and, and t- well tactically it's always easy to say well okay afterwards you know it worked so it must have been great but you know l- l- the facts are here two stage wins when uh, Bora uh, and grow se- seems to 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 have a more much more logical tactics, and so far, unfortunately for them, uh, it's, uh, it's you know they they're still empty-handed, and and then there must be you know the the, the the third week is looming, and what's uh, what's on offer? It's but funny, yeah. Bora Hansgrohe have gone close, but they haven't won a stage, and they've put a lot into it, haven't they? And today, we saw them really 
make the race extremely hard, but they, they used up a lot of their riders. You know, I mean, they could have done with one or two more in the finale there just to help keep it together for Sagan. Although, as we saw, Sagan didn't quite have the legs in the end. Well, no, Sagan was going backwards in the sprint, wasn't he? I mean, he faded uh, in a very un-Sagan-like well, he wasn't going way. backwards, but he was going forwards well, less, <laughs> less quickly. Oh, I pick you, I pick you up on that <laughs> off the... No, no, we were watching commentary we, the other we day, were, yeah. and somebody, somebody said yeah. someone was going backwards, and you said... They're not going backwards. They're just going forwards less quickly than the other guys. <laughs> oh, the pedant gets so pedanted. <laughs> yeah, fine. Fair enough. Um, the thing that's interesting about Sunweb is that they didn't get involved yesterday. So they kind of... they all in on uh, all in for the day that Hershey won a couple of days ago. All in again today in the finale. And, and probably picking their moments very well. And it... I know we, I said at the start, you can kind of ascribe to something when it works out like that. Wow, wasn't that perfectly worked? I mean, Nico Roach was kind of doing some policing at the front first. Then they had the first attack by Benute. Then they had the second attack by Hershey. Then the third attack from Kraut Anderson. And you, you go, well, it, they won. So therefore, it's absolutely perfect. Of course, it was, you know, it was, but, it, it, you know, you can't necessarily say, well, what we'll do is this, this and this, and then, then we'll win the stage. But the fact that they were all kind of hovering around at the front, all on the same page, all on the same wavelength, somebody goes, the next guy knows exactly what the, what to do when when it comes back together again, and then they go, you know, they they really, uh, they you know, they, they pulled it off brilliantly. They're kind of similar types of riders as well, in a way. Um Banu is a bit more of a diesel, so it was logical that he went first. Cranston's mm. punchier, and and Hershey is obviously very punchy as well. But might be a bit tired. Might be a bit tired, but the, the, there was a logic to it, um, and the fact that they are kind of all similar kinds of riders um, means that they can all. Well, today was perfect for them because there were a couple of launch pads, and they took full advantage of that. And it was yeah, it was it was yeah, it, it's good to see a team that perhaps doesn't have the biggest budget or the biggest stars, um, you know, getting some rewards for, for what is clearly quite a big effort. To, mm. To, mm. To, and we heard, hear from Nicky Sarn, one of our audio course, diarists, yeah. who's their road captain, and, you know, it's clear that, that they have quite a clear plan every day. Yeah, they, they, they've... I mean, Sun, Sunweb is also one of. The, I mean, they've, they've, they've now have been around for a long time, and they always privilege the same kind of approach to, uh, uh, which is very. Uh, how could I say? You, you could always be sympathetic to 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 them to to their approach. They, they, they've all they've never been real stars. Even Dumoulin, when he was there, uh, you know, uh, where well, what, what was the the, the, the nicest uh, of the of the of the GC contenders of the time. There, there, there seems to be a kind of philosophy around that team. Uh, well. Romain Bardet will be their, their leader uh, next season. We'll see how it unfolds. I, I think he, he's got, you know, the, the, it, it'll be kind of refreshing for him. Uh, ho- hopefully they won't be, with, you know, working too much for him, like, you know, no. Bora Hansgrohe uh, are working a little bit too much for Peter Sagan. You know, talking about, uh, about Bora Hansgrohe, I think if, you know, if, if Mark Ursch is, is an inspiration as, you know, third time lucky, uh, Leonard Kemner should, should really have his... Uh, Who was at Sunweb last year? Yeah. <laughs> that's true, you know. Yeah. So you have the same, man, but probably the same mentality. But well, hopefully for him, because he deserves it, he'll have another chance before the end. Camden, I thought last year rode really well on, in the Pyrenees uh, in the stage that finished above Foix, where Simon Yates won. He rode really well that day, and I thought somewhere have unearthed another gem here, and he moved on to Bora Hansgrohe. But that's the one thing about some of they do unearth gems and then they move on, and and they have a habit of losing riders even mid-contract i mean tom de Mula, now michael matthews and as much as we can well their their strategy has paid off brilliantly i mean they came into the race without a gc rider without a sprinter who you would say well they're nailed on to win a stage whether it you know case ball or casper pedersen you know they're not in the same league as bennett and you and and and, and others but they have got a luxury um, that the freedom that they they created for themselves gives them an opportunity on a day like today that Lotto Sudal and uh, De Koning Quickstep don't have because you know Thomas again we saw attacking but they're already down uh, you know to six riders still six isn't it um, and they've got people you know. Well, Caleb Ewan and Co. out the back today. Um, De Koning Quickstep they've got to look after. 
um, Sam Bennett, which leaves um, Julian Alaphilippe very much on his own. Bora Hansgrohe, you know, they've got uh, their, you know they've got Sagan, but then they've also got guys for the mountains. They're kind of straddling a couple of things. Sunweb on a day like today are, are kind of all in in the same way that De Koenig Quickstep would be all in for Bennett on a sprint stage or Lotto Sudal would be all in for I, I, Ewan I, on a yeah, sprint I stage. I spoke to Luke Roberts at the Vuelta last year. You can hear that interview in our Vuelta coverage last year, somewhere DS. He's not here, he's at Terreno Adriatico. But I remember him saying that he was really <laughs> excited about De Moulin leaving because he used up so much resources as a GC contender. He was really looking forward to being able to just go to races to try and, and win them with other riders, different plans and so on. And it's really freed them up to, to yeah, have a go at doing other things. Uh, in, in By the same token, I mean, I, I, well, I, I've i always been a Michael Matthews fan, so uh, I, w- I would have liked to see him on this tour because, I mean, the, the route was perfect for him and I, uh, it would have been a different uh, Sunweb team, obviously. But, but you know, it, it, it would probably be, well, you know, it's... it's difficult to say things like that but I think that given the form he had before uh, the Tour de France well Mathieu will probably be in the green jersey uh, as we speak and they might have won a, 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 a well maybe one stage but but in, in a se- but, but huge in the same speculation time, here from yeah sure but in the same time <laughs> yeah, of course but in the same time it would have spoiled the, the Sunweb show we, we've been seeing so no regrets you know what's interesting is that they're signing Bardet who will suck resources into but I think Bardet is joining them because he wants to, to do be something part different. of that and and be yeah. somebody who maybe doesn't base his season around the Tour de France. Mm. And, and we've seen him in one-day races be really competitive. I think he wants to do something different, and I think that's why he's joining them. Before we go on to Richie Port, Luke Roberts being at Tirreno Adriatico, which is in March. I mean, it's amazing. He must be a <laughs> time traveller. <laughs> incredible, <laughs> incredible. Yeah, well, we haven't mentioned Tirreno Adriatico. No, maybe haven't. people uh, in our press conference on Monday will ask us questions about that. That's a little reminder that on Monday we're doing our second press conference. Email us, contact at thecyclingpodcast.com with your question. Audio file if you can. We prefer to hear a voice. So please send us in some questions. We've had some questions, Lionel. We've had some pretty good questions, yeah, already. Great. But we'd, we'd like some more great well listen uh, Richie Port has been one of the the, the stories of the, this tour I suppose um, he has crept into the top 10 I mean he's riding extremely well and seems to be riding better he missed out on the crosswind stage lost a bit of time that day um, but he's riding very very well the best we've seen in years and he's not had the bad luck that we've seen him have in years he seems like a, a new man I spoke to him this, the, at the start this morning uh, reborn Richie here he is, Richie Port. How are you? How are you? Yeah, good. You're doing well. Yeah. You must be happy. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy with uh, how things are at the moment. Obviously, not happy to have lost Balka yesterday. Um, you know, he's in great form. He didn't deserve that. You know, no fault of his own. But me personally, I'm enjoying the race. Um, you know, it's it's been good fun. And, uh, you know, we're slowly getting towards Paris, which is you know, a good thing. That yesterday looked like just a real raw test of form and, and fitness, and you were you were there with the the top guys. That you must take huge encouragement from that. Yeah, I mean, obviously a little bit behind those two Slovenian guys there, but I was happy with yesterday. You know, I think I look at it, and I probably won the Masters category yesterday. <laughs> I think I was the first of the older guys, but um, this new generation, they're, they're something special, and to be up there around them at my age, I, I was happy with. What's our realistic aim for you in Paris? Ah, oh, look, hopefully top 10. But, uh, you know, for me, it's a funny one because as much as I want to do that, the biggest thing for me is to get home and meet my daughter who was born, you know, eight days ago. That's probably the, the biggest thing for me. But it doesn't mean that's going to change anything. I'm here to fight and, uh, you know, top 10, I'd love to do that. It'd be a nice way to finish out my, uh, my tour career. You know, I don't think I'll be back here riding for myself again um, you must have you know worked very hard in lockdown I guess everybody did but coming out of that was there a bit of mystery around where your form would be in comparison to everybody else I mean there always was but in lockdown um, you know to be honest lockdown was a blessing in disguise for me because firstly you get time at home with the family which you never do but being uh, in Australia for Tour Down Under obviously always motivates. So to be able to come off that, do Paris Nice, and then have you know seven, eight weeks of, of nothing, you know, gain six, seven kilograms, and um, which you know for me that's quite easy. But I was 
motivated enough for it to uh, to lose that. And you know, of course, the first races were a shock to the system. They were for everyone. I mean, the racing was something like I've never experienced um, coming out of the lockdown period. It was so hard and and just brutal. But look, I, I mean, mentally, I'm in a good place. Um, I'm excited for the rest of this year. I'm excited for the last two years of my career as well. And can the Slovenians be beaten finally, do you think? I mean, Bernal won this race last year, so, you know, he's got a great team behind him and it's not over until it's over. I mean, Balka's testament to that, you know. You don't do a thing wrong and the next minute you're, you're on the ground and in, in hospital. So, yeah, I'd like to see a good fair fight, but uh, I think for me, Roglic is uh, super duper. Good luck, Richie. Thank Thanks you. a lot. See you later. Shoot, uh, shoot at l'arrière du peloton, cycling podcast, team car, the back of the pack, please. Our Tour de France coverage is supported by the next generation Watt Bike Atom. Yesterday we heard about how Steve Cooper recovered from not only a hip resurfacing operation, but also a vasectomy with the Watt Bike. Today he's going to tell us about how he is using the Watt Bike now he's well on the road to recovery. The great thing with the Watt Bike, it can fit in around my lifestyle. I've got three young children, a wife um, and, a, and a busy life. So consequently I wanted something that I could train indoors when I, I didn't have the ability or the time to train outdoors so it, it's a lifestyle thing for me i've got the ability to get my training kit, kit on clip in and get straight into a session all in all i think for me it's just the case of getting on the bike and being as fit as i can be lowering my heart rate getting my technique right improving my power and speed um my favorite aspect would be um just improving my ftp and knowing i'm getting fitter my heart rate zones i can see i, I know i'm getting fitter obviously the more the more I put in, the healthier and better I will be. And improving as a cyclist, I'm ringing it out for all it's worth on a watt bike. So when I actually go on the road, I, I can feel the benefits of that, even though it might be a, a, in a condensed period, give it 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour. You can get the most out of that session and know my technique's improving. So when I do get on the road bike, I'm getting the benefits. It's my pedaling technique as well, because you've got your, um, your PES scores is a real help to know that I'm thinking about it and, and it's improving me in terms of technique. You're actually thinking about how you're riding and how you're cycling. So it's a fantastic bit of kit for me to have and I think you can you can notice real real improvements, vast improvements in a short space of time on a watt bike. It's just a massive benefit for me. So anyone that was thinking about one, I'd, I'd, I'd fully, fully advocate it and say go for it because... It is like an elephant in the room. So many people have, have these exercise bikes and just don't get around to using rowing machines. But for me, it's the mental thing as well as the physical because getting on it, I'm a, I'm a better version of me afterwards. The Watt Bike Atom is available now from £90 per month. Go to wattbike.com to find out more. That's W-A-T-T-B-I-K-E.com. Well, before the break there, we heard from Richie Port, who suggested that he was the first masters rider uh, mm. the other day the, the well, and we got talking in the car didn't we about whether there should be a jersey for the best 35 or over rider the gray jersey the gray jersey yeah the podium at the moment in the gray jersey competition would be richie port then alejandro valverde good four minutes back and then you have to look a long way down to greg van avermaet who's uh well he's over an hour behind he's not going to win the gray jersey this year but <laughs> it's interesting that we were talking a few days ago about how liberated richie port looked um, if it was more of a silvery jersey, it would go well with his gold helmet, wouldn't it? Just these <laughs> some bronze shorts. Well, yeah. and, and these days, actually, a grey jersey should, should go to, to the over 25, because when you look at the yeah. guys, you know, in contention. No, I think 35 is <laughs> a good, a good yeah. age. I mean, that's properly veteran, isn't it? But mm. you've wow. made the point a few times in the tour, Richard, about how it's becoming a younger man's game. And we've joked a little bit about how... The Tour de France is almost uh, the Tour de l'Avenir. There's a, an under-25... Well, the, the white jersey competition, when you look at the, the names um, in that competition, Pogacar, Bernal, Mas, Igita, Kamna, Hershey, Sivakov, not that you know he's been struggling with injury, Asklin, Cavagna, Mads Pedersen, the world champion, of course. Even Benoit Cosnefois, I didn't realise, mm. was eligible for the he white is, jersey yeah, competition. There's a real crop of young riders here in the race. But Richie Port definitely looks like he's riding without any weight on his the shoulders. Weight is gone. Yeah, and, and he is 
you know, he said a few times that this is his last tour as a as a team leader. He's, he, I don't know, has he confirmed it? But we know he's going to Ineos mm. Grenadiers for the next two years, back to his old team, and he's clearly going there in a in a sort of domestic deluxe role and relishing it. You know, I think he 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 said he's enjoying this this tour, and that's apparent in the, in the way that he's riding, and he's riding very well. You know, he was close uh, yesterday to. The Slovenian Slovenian pair. Um, well, not only close, but he he ag- went yeah, across the gap and his aggressively. Seem quite modest. He he wants to finish in the top ten, but I think again that's just a way of taking the pressure off himself. And I'm sure he's just going to, you know, see what happens, but ride as well as he can. But he's he's riding very well. It's, it's mm. nice to see actually because you always feel that 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 you know he went he left Team Sky to become a team leader at BMC and now at Tra- Trek Segafredo, and that responsibility has rested very heavily on his shoulders and you know y- you don't get the impression he's been enjoying it an awful lot and so it's nice to see him with a smile on his face and enjoying it and he seemed that way this morning yeah the, the definitely i mean in in the climbs uh, fr- from what we've seen behind the two slovenians and uh, well and, and 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 the you know odd colombians because the kind of sw- switching roles in the climbs the the, the most Probably the most consistent climber in this Tour de France has been Richie Port. Do you remember the 2014 Tour, Rich, when uh, Chris Froome, of course, crashed out before it even reached the cobbles? And Richie Port, Team Skies, uh, well, he inherited the leadership, didn't he? And there was the stage to La Planche de Belfi, which moved him up to second place behind Vincenzo Nibali. And a good couple of minutes down, but do you remember the press conference where all the spotlight was on him and you could see him over the course of an hour's or 40 minutes worth of questions almost sort of shrinking uh, as a realisation that he was the leader and that there was an expectation that he might finish on the podium or even challenge to win the tour just d- didn't seem to sit terribly comfortably with him and he, and he, he, he kind of folded under that pressure expectation and finished uh, 23rd I think um, and, he, and he became a father again eight days ago um, so he's probably you know, racing towards Paris in a way, um, with a real, a, a sort of, I don't know, a lightness in his mm. step. Well, let's face it, I think we, uh, you know, sometimes, you, 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 we're, I know we're journalists and we're kind of objective, but we, we, all, we all like Richie Pont, you know, him very much, I think. Well, I find him very honest. I yeah, mean, he's, I, he's I've always found him very honest. And, and you know, he, over the years, he's, he's given me some great interviews just because he can't really help himself um he he's a he's yeah he's an honest guy it'd be good to go and do a proper kind of in-depth yeah and it, uh, well, as he proved again you know with the masters tourist he's a good one for one-liners as well he's got, he's got this this uh, you know ability of, of saying i mean he's yeah he's he's, he's cute <laughs> i could say <laughs> so, <laughs> well we start, started his career riding for the Pretes team in uh, out of tasmania i mean a man after my own heart there because it's sponsored by basically a sort of jacket potato <laughs> outlet retail outlet Pretes. um you can have loads of different toppings on your jacket potato. Tons of butter. <laughs> Tons of butter, yeah. Oh, lovely. Anyway. Cheese we, and all we should, sorts. We mm. should segue from, from this into a, a more sober discussion around Roman Bardet because what happened to him, and, you know, it, it's amazing that he finished the stage as strongly as he did. It was such a tough uh, climb up to the finish. And he's got um, a small hemorrhage, um, a bleeding on the brain. Um, and so it wasn't, you know... It, he was in a bad way um and it's it's opened the discussion about um the concussion protocol in cycling and we did an interview with ian boswell earlier this year where he talked about you know the complexity of diagnosing a concussion and it can happen with a, a seemingly quite light knock to the head you can not be concussed after quite a heavy blow to the head um, and and the, the 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 topics come up a few times. It, ha- it happens whenever somebody crashes and they appear to blow their head quite badly. It happened at the Dauphine actually when Pavel Sivakov came off and appeared to hit his head off the ground quite hard. Um, but it, in cycling, as the the race moves on, you can't really take someone off the field of play, examine them, and then put them back. 
because the race will be several kilometers up the road. Yes, it's been a big issue in other sports like like rugby and obviously American football, where it's become a real crusade, you know, to to because I mean some of the, these guys, you know, doing these these sports are really their, their lives uh, endangered by the, the the practice of their sport. Uh, I. I I wanted to know exactly what happened to, uh, or at least uh, as much as it could uh, tell us, uh, you know, the edge to La Mondiale, uh, to tell us well, what happened to Romain Bardet, uh, well, you know, how, how he left uh, the race and to discuss a little bit concussion. Uh, well, I, I talked to Yves Perret, who is the, uh, uh, the press chief, and he's also very, very close, uh, very close to Romain Bardet. He's, he's really kind of his bodyguard and, and very, you know, humanly Uh, close to uh, uh, to Romain, and um, well, this is what uh, he said this morning about Romain Bardet's abandon. If uh, well, we learned uh, late uh, last evening that Romain was uh, calling it quits. Uh, how, how is he now? I mean, what's uh, what's the situation? Well, Romain left the hotel uh, this morning with his uh, wife and kid. Uh, well, he, he slept well, but he was uh, still. Uh, Uh, in trouble and uh, and uh, he wasn't able to to, to continue the race. Uh, you know, he get in very heavy crash and uh, and the only solution was for him uh, to, to to quit the race. You know what he did yesterday, uh, continuing to race uh, and fighting with Guillaume Martin and uh, is is uh, is simply uh, amazing because uh, I think uh, that so few few rider who could be able to. To overcome the pain and to, to do what he did, but it's it's Roma, you know. He, since he's, he turned professional, he he only quit five races. It's the fifth time he's he's, 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 he's quitting a race. So uh, so it's Roma. It's amazing, uh, even more so because he, he talked to the press quite clearly at the end of the stage. Everything he looked well, not all right, but he looked in in almost you know in his normal condition. Um, yeah, he took to the press, but he, he, I felt that he was uh, uh, not in the, in the usual uh, way of speaking. So that's why I, 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 I cut uh, after one one interview because I, I felt that he that he wasn't uh, he wasn't able to, to go to go further and he needed to, to to rest and to to get some medical examination. There, there is a, there are suggestions now that maybe cycling should address concussion problems like rugby has been doing. Uh, what, what do you think in the team about that? You know, uh, we, we, we used to say that cycling is a different sport, but uh, for this topic, uh, cycling is a really different sport. Uh, uh, rugby, you can stop the game, uh, see what happened to the, to the, to the player. Uh, you cannot ask to a rider that feel uh, able to, to, to continue the race to stop and to wait that uh, the, 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 the head of the race uh, is still still riding you know it's really a complicated topics and I think that uh, uh, there, there are a lot of, of issues to, to solve and to say wha what you, you can say you know uh, every uh, yesterday when the, 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 the doctor of the race asked to Roma how he felt he said I'm okay. And when you see what he's been doing uh, at that time, uh, you know, th that kind of athletes are, are, are really uh, able to overcome the pain. And, uh, and, uh, but it's a, real, it's a real issue, but the, the, the answer is really difficult to find. I think the fact that it's taken, you know, the best part of a day for the uh, confirmation that Roman Bardet had suffered a small hemorrhage to become public knowledge, um, indicates the complexity of this issue i mean last night the ag2r team doctor said in a statement this is eric bouver said in a statement this examination did not reveal any lesions however it's necessary for roman to stop his sports activity and not be able to start the stage tomorrow that was after a brain scan at the clement ferrand university hospital so um it's a, as you say richard a, a, a minor knock could result in a, a fairly mi major concussion a major knock might not necessarily result in a concussion and with a sport as fast moving as cycling I, I just think back to um, the episode of the cycling podcast Feminine from the women's tour where we heard from the race doctor talking about the difficulty of diagnosing in a very quick um, period of time on the side of the road uh, to decide whether or not a rider is uh, able to to rejoin the peloton and, and yeah, knowing was, yeah that was stage one twenty 
19, I think, and it was after Abby Van Twisk's crash because it was in, in the final kilometre and there, there was, some people said she'd been concussed, others didn't. She did finish the stage, um, but that topic was was one that pe- were, people were discussing. Yeah. And, and the doctor said that, you know, the, the, the difficulty is that the race is off and going and if the doctor makes a decision to pull the rider out of the race there and then... Yeah, you ha- there isn't enough time to do a proper concussion mm. um, examination. So, the, you know, the the UCI protocol, which is I have in front of me here, which says that uh, you know any of the any of the symptoms such as headache or uh, you know cognitive problems or emotional um, un- instability or physical signs such as a loss of consciousness or amnesia. I mean, a loss of loss of consciousness is easy, relatively speaking. Uh, amnesia is is more difficult behavioral changes example irritability well that's difficult to diagnose on the roadside in a matter of minutes cognitive impairment such as slowed reaction times again very difficult to diagnose sleep disturbance well i mean that's something to be uh, you know assessed overnight not on the roadside and so whilst i understand and share the concern for riders just getting back on their bike and getting back into the race immediately i also do have some sympathy for first the rider whose instinct will be to get back on their bike and get back in the race and secondly for the staff of the team and thirdly for the for the race doctor themselves as well who that's a that is a huge call to make to say sorry you're out you're out of the race it would have to be a very obvious case of um some kind of cognitive malfunction yeah well to, as to we know what, 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 what they're doing in cycling races races in alpine skiing which is another sport where you have uh, fr- frequent concussions uh is that usually and you remember the uh, well <laughs> we will get back to it but what they do normally they ask the rider to their names or the or the, the athlete their name and if if most of the time the, uh, the, the rider says you know the athlete says well i'm roman bardet um, that's my age and blah 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 they think is is kind of conscious enough uh, to 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 go ahead and you remember the, the the anecdote about Gary Thomas, who, 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 who had a bad crash once, and uh, was well asked by the by the doctor because that's a normal procedure. What's your name? And he said Chris Froome. I mean, the, the well, <laughs> yeah, that was the stage into the gap, wasn't it? Mm. Warren Bargill was it? Warren Bargill cut in front of him, took him off the mm-hmm. road, and he crashed quite heavily. Mm-hmm. Um, that was, I think, he was joking. <laughs> yeah, of course he was joking. I don't think. He, I think if he said he was Chris Froome, <laughs> I think he would have been pulled from the race for sure. <laughs> but it's a, it's a. It's a problem in a sport where um, falling off is part of the risk and happens frequently. Um, the, the issue with the Roman Bardet incident is that the, the footage does look bad. I mean, he gets up, his legs look unstable, he sits back down again, he gets back up and gets on his bike. And with the information that we now have, you can look at that footage with a lot more knowledge. And so, therefore, it looks if anything, worse now than it did at the time. Yeah, but as I discussed with Yves Perret when we were in the interview, I mean, uh, not not only did Romain Bardet finish the, the stage, but he, he answered two questions by the journalists in almost normally. So, which, uh, you know, very, very tricky one. So what's the answer? Well, I, well, I'm, you know, I don't work for the UCI. I'm not a doctor. I mean, they, 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 I think they should really look into that, uh, find the, 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 the find, the, you know, d- decide on a protocol to be applied uh, very carefully every time, and that's that's the only way. Because I mean, uh, uh, we saw this morning the the, the tour of, uh, the Tour de France doctor going in in the mix zone, talking to lots of journalists and almost trying to kind of justify justify her decision uh, when when actually I don't think she's to blame in any way. But if the if it takes say for argument's sake ten minutes to do an adequate concussion check when we when you see a player go off in rugby and they go back to the dressing room and then they come back on having been given a uh, the green light after a concussion check you know 10 minutes in a cycling race as you say Francois that's that's basically it game over so on what basis do you decide whether or not somebody has hit their head how how would you know do you every crash some crashes, a crash where some footage emerges, a, a rider looks unsteady. It's it's such a difficult one to um, to, and it's very very easy detached as we are watching and saying, no, oh, that doesn't look right. It's very easy for us to say there should be a better way, but unless somebody can suggest a better way, I mean, yeah. I, I have seen a couple of people suggesting some kind of concussion van where they the riders would get in it, be assessed, and then be dropped back off in the peloton. 
in the that, place that, that they were. Be, that might be the the best solution. I mean, it's a bit like taking a lap out in a criterium or something. In bike racing, you could do that. The thing with Bardet as well is he was, you know, he was still up there overall. He was he was a contender, and so it's a big call to pull him out of the race or even to stop him for any length of time to examine it. I'm not going to say, and no one's going to pretend to have concussion, but if somebody's lying fifth overall falls off, I mean, the, the problem is, if you have some kind of system like that, th yeah, it, it's got I, to be I applied. Really yeah, I, I, well, the yeah. problem with that as well. I mean, well, I've been in the I've, I've been in the cycling business for too long, not to think that some wicked team or rider may use the the, no, <laughs> the I, concussion I really, van to, to cheat. I have you know, to sort of pour some <laughs> cold water on this suggestion. I don't. I don't think that's a concern. I mean, it's not. A I'm, not I'm not suggesting. But I'm, what I'm saying is, if you that. no, I, I think that's that that could be a reasonable solution to it. But I, I don't know. I mean, did, did people talk about concussion in the days before riders wore helmets? Because the helmets now offer offer some protection, you know, and, and the helmets are designed to to try and minimise the, the the impact of a crash. As a, a point that Ian Boswell I think has made is that the helmets mean that the riders can take a heavier hit right, okay, and yeah. and be okay, you know, and and so. You know, if if um, if you hit the ground without a helmet on, I'm, I mean, I'm not in any way saying get rid of helmets. That's not the point I'm making. But the point I'm making is that in the old days, if you hit the ground hard and you were pouring with blood and you, you had to, you know, get patched up or, it, you know, there's an obvious, an mm. obvious visible. And this is the thing, isn't it? When we talk about somebody having, you know, a, a, a knee injury or, a, you know, some kind of wound, when it's visible, it's much, much easier for the rider to go, ah, oh, this is this is not right. Yeah, but Whereas a concussion yeah. can be masked by all sorts of other things. Yeah. The, the, the adrenaline the, of hitting the ground, mm. the the rush to get sure. back in the race the, can the, all mask the, the, the symptoms. The, the only solution, we, we live in a zero risk uh, society as we, as we see with the corona, you know, coronavirus crisis and many other crises. So probably to be you know, in trend with the times, the, 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 the only slightest doubt of the concussion should lead to the uh, you know the uh, exclusion of the rider uh, for on safety uh, you know grounds uh, which would also be discussed and, and and controversial in which case but maybe that's the thing to do if the if the doctor suspects there might be concussion even even if in the end the guy's perfectly all right he should be you know for his own safety uh, ruled out of the race i don't know le vin du jour à votre santé Cheers Lionel. Cheers, Cheers François. A white Beaujolais. A white Beaujolais. White Beaujolais. What do you make of that? Mm, it's, it's, it's uncommon, but yes, they do. They even do Beaujolais, Beaujolais rosé. There are not that many of those. But yeah, obviously, the well, there's not that many white Beaujolais because Beaujolais are light uh, wines, pretty fruity, and they, they can't, even the reds are kind, they're kind of in the same category of the whites, like what we call the vin de soif in French, meaning, you know, uh, wines for thirst, you know, when you're thirsty. Uh, but uh, yeah, I've, I've very rarely uh, had uh, white Beaujolais, and it's quite quite good, actually, good stuff. Beaujolais is kind of much mocked. My um, wife and her French friends in London always have Beaujolais nights, and there's much kind of guffawing and laughing. It feels like a, a joke that I'm not quite getting. Well... The, the the Beaujolais well the, the, the problem with Beaujolais it, it it's it's a uh, it's an area near Lyon it's actually not, almost you know the the, the the national wine of Lyon it, but it, it it lost a little bit of its reputation because of Beaujolais Nouveau and uh, and every time when when the Beaujolais crop you know is done and they they have the first wines coming up they they have this this day of Beaujolais Nouveau when actually the the, the wine that you get on on that day well you you drink lots of those because it's very weak and but it's it's not very good either so it, it's it's a kind of party you get for Beaujolais Nouveau you get very drunk uh, on on kind of a pretty well sometimes terrible wine so but actually the Beaujolais the, the, there's lots of wine different wines in the Beaujolais region you've got Beaujolais you've got Morgon uh, Moulin Avant uh, Julienas uh, what else uh, Fleury uh, uh, well I'll, I'll forget I'm sure to forget some but anyway um, and and 
and they are actually very very good and they were they were one of the first area in France to go for the you know organic wine biodynamic and nature wine so I think the reputation is going up again now uh, Beaujolais wines and and this white is really good so you know Beaujolais Nouveau that's that's it that's the that's the that's the fun party what do you think Lionel are you enjoying your Beaujolais Blanc yeah it's very nice it's quite fruity very nice that's my line I'm I'm not a big white wine fan I must be honest but this is a yeah very nice nice the cycling podcast is supported by science in sport science in sport fueled by science thank you very much indeed to science and sport for their support of the cycling podcast if you want 25 percent off all your science and sport products go to scienceandsport.com and enter the code francois <laughs> so yes cp25 yay yeah. <laughs> Woo! it's taken <laughs> nearly two weeks cp25 <laughs> yes thank you to science and sport very much indeed um I saw Stephen Moon today, the chief executive of Science and Sport, was uh, expressing some pride at the fact that riders were wolfing down Science and Sport products, even riders not on teams supplied by Science and Sport. So there you go. What an endorsement of Science and Sport as the world's best sports nutrition company. Obviously, because they support the cycling podcast. Um, Now, we're going to hear from Alan Piper, uh, the sports director, the veteran sports director at UAE Team Emirates. I mean, Alan Piper's been around the block, hasn't he? He was sports director at BMC, HTC High Road. Was he at Quick Step briefly? No, I think so. I thought he was, but I, I think he was. Maybe uh, not. I think I was um, And obviously a, a former rider of some note. Uh, and now he's at UAE Team Emirates and he's got on his hands one of the most exciting prospects in world cycling Tade Pogacar and you spoke to him this morning from yeah, and, so we hear from Alan Piper absolutely now. and you know he sounded really excited by you know seeing such you know raw talent in many ways in his hands and well you know lots of ambitions his second aiming for more actually as a sports director I, it's uh, it's a pretty easy ride with Tade I told him last night that this race is really no different than every other race I do, but he makes it easy and he makes us look good because he's so good. But at the same time, it was fantastic. He moves up to second place, but I think it's really important that we keep our feet on the ground, especially me. Uh, we take it day by day and we, we look to the next eight days for opportunities uh, to see when we can move up, uh, maybe try and take that first place off Roglic. We changed the expectation, I think, after the Pyrenees. We had, a, we had, a, we had a, a, a clearer idea of the final objective. And uh, I think all of us within the team believe that. So we just stay on track for that, keep our feet on the ground, and uh, be as intelligent as we can. We, we, can't, see, we can't see Tade's limits. Can, can you see limits in this guy? Well... There, there are limits, obviously, because Roglic uh, is leading by 44 seconds. Today, until now, really has been the only rider that's attacked in the Tour de France. Uh, so I'm expecting some movement to come from other favourites in the next days, especially tomorrow called La Colombière. If Bernal wants to win, he needs to take time back, and he could wait until Wednesday. But... Um, I think the other favourites will need to, to make some moves and then we can see what Tadej can still do. How much of a problem is it that he lost, you know, well, uh, crucial teammates uh, earlier in the tour? Of course, of course, it's a, it was a blow to lose two really good teammates. I mean, in the overall general plan of, of the Tour de France, but we have to adapt to every situation and I think we are adapting. Um, looking at the, 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 long, the long ball game of getting to Paris in the ideal position. So we just chip away at that every day and uh, use our resources really wisely and hopefully uh, the race will fall our way. Second is, is, is a great uh, place, obviously, but uh, do you think the, the first place is within reach? 
Well, it's 44 seconds in reach. He's in second place, so there's only one place to go. But of course, he had a he has really a warrior that he has to come up against in Roglic. You know, seems like he has an impenetrable armor with his team, and also he's riding really strong. Shows no sign of weakness until now. So, I think the main thing is just uh, stay focused, keep the feet on the ground, stay concentrated, and we just look for opportunities. Well, on paper, there. Um making the the observation that Pogacar has been the only rider to really attack the yellow jersey. We should say Bernal had a little go today. He he went off the front. Um, I heard his interview at the finish, and I think it was just an an instinctive thing to do. Um, he saw a chance. He, he had a, a wee go. It didn't quite work out, but a positive sign, an encouraging sign. But Pogacar has been the guy who... He is an attacking rider, and we've seen him. He sort of had to go on the attack because he lost that time in the crosswind stage. But the way he rides, very exciting, and I don't imagine he's going to stop doing that. No, but just on Bernal, it was interesting after yesterday's stage to slightly belatedly hear him talking about how his numbers and his uh, the, the feeling is as good as last this stage last year. But he just can't. He obviously can't go with. Uh, Roglic at the moment whether that's uh, something that the pendulum will swing in the in the last week I don't know but Pogacar there was that comment from him earlier in the tour when he said something like uh, I knew before I came to the tour that it wasn't kindergarten you know um, that, that that it requires uh, you know it's a it's a race for kind of old heads and old legs mm. but um, we, we will see um, how, he, how he goes tomorrow on the climb to uh, Le Grand Colombia. Colombia the impression you get is that he, is, he doesn't look at his numbers or if he does you know he's not he's not afraid you know to, to see the, 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 the power meter you know go nuts because he he really you know obviously goes uh, over the limit tomorrow is a very hard stage again uh, you know to Grand Colombia uh, the, the same kind of finish probably and maybe even harder than the than Puy Marie uh, yesterday, uh, well, uh, that, that there's you know that, that I think this Tour de France is interesting because of the repetition of uh, the, 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 these climbs and uh, are all different and all kind of the same. Um, we, we'll probably see well uh, another you know uh, uh, you know showdown between uh, Ro- the, the two Slovenians Roglic and Pogacar. Uh, we, we we had the impression Roglic was doing a little bit better. Uh, yesterday in Pumari, well, we, we will see. Oddly enough, I mean, today, uh, if you know, if if the Sunweb tactics uh, had failed, we might have had a third <laughs> Slovenian uh, stage win. Mm. Uh, you know, with Luca Mest sort of finishing second, winning the bunch sprint. Uh, well, you teed it up yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. Have I, I mean, three Slovenians going to win tomorrow, <laughs> isn't he? Uh, after being interviewed tonight for the cycling. Well, who knows? It could, it could be uh, there. I mean, the Grand Colombia is now is now quickly becoming a classic. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, even though it was it was not in the past one of the of those climbs that the Tour de France was going to very often. But, but it's a proper Alp, isn't it? I mean, it's uh, you know we didn't have a summit finish in the Pyrenees. The uh, the Puymeri is different. This is a proper, you know, 18, 19 kilometre long climb uh, with some steep bits and an o- average gradient that, that will really bring the GC riders to the and, fore. And, and anyone on a bad day will, will concede some ground tomorrow. And in my, uh, the fact that as we're in the green, you know, we, 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 we touched a, 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 you know, about it a little bit uh, yesterday, but, you know, uh, in, the, in the COVID crisis, the, the tomorrow and or in the old stage, we're in, the, we're in the green zone, uh, you know, red zone, I mean, in the, in, in terms of coronavirus, which means that the uh, restrictions on the race are even tougher than they, they've been so far. And tomorrow, the the the, the, the excitement maybe or the 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 the, the, the Ventoux aspect of the Grand Colombier could be even enhanced by the fact that there would be absolutely no spectator in the in the in the final climb, no no press either. I mean, it'll be very isolated, so it'll be really the men against the mountain, and it's going to be even more exciting. Yeah, big crowds again today, actually, mm. and. You know the the sort of these token gestures, it seems to me, made by the tour to prevent people from being within sort of four hundred meters of the finish and the podium and so on. About at the start today, you know, I, I, I we were we've got a mix zone set up, and where you were waiting to get into the mix zone as a journalist, there were just crowds of people streaming past, and I I, I don't know, I think given the situation. The, the Tour de France has mm. not done its best, I don't think, 
to control the crowds. It's not controlled the crowds as well as it could have done. It's a, I mean, the sense from the UK is that, that it's mask wearing and social distancing, not one or the other. And, and there was a feeling in Clermont Ferrand, and it was similar in Nice, I felt uneasy in Nice, um, that the masks give you some kind of immunity. And I'm not sure that that's necessarily the case. But I mean, I, I don't know. I'm not a virologist. I just, I, you know, I feel feel quite cautious in in places i mean we we come to this hotel and the rule is one person in the lift whereas in uh, in clement ferrand i got in the lift the other morning and three people shoved in after me and it was like you know was crammed was in there like sardines that woman with her suitcase oh, the well. woman in the suitcase that that pushed in front of me on the way down to breakfast and then pushed in front of me on the way back up from breakfast as well unbelievable amazing anyway extraordinary Listen, before we go um tomorrow uh, we will release the latest episode of Service Course, presented by Tom Wally, who's producing this episode. Thanks, Tom. And Lizzie Banks, who is writing the Giro Rosa. The latest episode is Tour de France Tech, Saddles and Sleuthing. We're going to listen to that tomorrow morning in the car. Looking forward to that. It's always great. Um, very entertaining. Have you ever listened to an episode of Service Course, Francois? I, 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 I can't understand the word of, the, of what's what's been said, but I, I do listen to it. <laughs> well, it's tech. <laughs> it's, it's bike tech. And it's not something I thought I'd be interested in, but they do such a great job that it is interesting. Uh, and in this episode, we'll te- uh, Tour de France tech, saddles and sleuthing um, speaks for itself. We'll report back tomorrow night, but do give it a listen. Um, and thanks to Tom and Lizzie. We said last night um, that Stacey Snyder is... Uh, creating, producing one-off Peddler de Charme cut mug, I think. It's a one-off Peddler de Charme mug for the Peddler de Charme of this Tour de France. Keep your nominations coming in, please. Uh, we want a good winner of the Peddler de Charme mug. Um, Kilometre Zero resumes on Monday with our audio diarists, I think, on Monday. Our, our audio diarists are all getting... Uh, mugs from Stacey Snyder as well, which is very nice. Um, if they're listening, sorry to spoil the surprise. Um, <laughs> but let's wrap it up for tonight. We're in the Alps tomorrow. Before we go, big thanks to some friends of the podcast. If you want to sign up as a friend of the podcast, go to thecyclingpodcast.com. But from me, a big thank you to Juliet Austin, Stephen Wales, Mark McLachlan, Joseph Ashworth, Christopher Joy Webb, and Mr. J. Whitfield Seed. And a big thank you to Gareth Williams, Mr. P.D. Cook, Javier Contreras Tenorio, Ross Cunliffe, Mr. G.B.J. Morton, and Matthew Howard. And a grand merci to Lincoln Ellis, Fraser Ski- Skilling, yeah. Joe Alter, Mac- Mark Dolby, Chris Hayes, and Ralph Percival. Thank you. Thank you, Lionel. Thanks, Rich. Thank you, Francois. Thank you. 